What does the perfect body look like? Starting from ancient Greece, beauty standards have been shaped by this question. This has led to somewhat of a consensus. Broad shoulders and a narrow waist for males, large hips and a pear-shaped body for females. However, these standards seem relatively outdated, leading to a necessary re-evaluation of what the modern canons should be. This is the ambitious task of Netflix's Physical 100, a Korean survival show in which only the fittest survive. Right off the bat, we face a conundrum. Are we trying to select beautiful bodies or capable ones? For some, who associate a six-pack with athleticism and big arms with strength, the answer is obvious. It's both. The introduction episode seems to corroborate that idea. Every participant is displayed alongside a sculpture of their torso, seemingly presenting muscle mass as the most important trait to possess. The candidates themselves go around the room, marveling at the size of some of these statues, actively ignoring athletes of smaller stature, and seeming more intimidated by the mass monsters amongst them. This is a trap. Just like the competitors, our attention is immediately captured by the most formidable shapes. If you watch the show, bodies like that of Yoon Song Bin, the skeleton racer with bulging biceps, or Kim Kang Min, the bodybuilder with coconut delts and tree trunk legs, will have naturally caught your attention. But there's a little chance of you having noticed the scrawny ice climber or the underwhelming crossfitter. With this misdirection, Physical 100 prepares to subvert your expectations, and it starts with quest number one. The goal here is simple. Hang onto a monkey bar until you can't anymore. Just like that, the cards have been redistributed. Just because you're big or strong won't guarantee victory here. If anything, it might be your downfall. This is proven immediately by the fact that all of the big guys fall off almost immediately. It also points to another key aspect of the game. Regardless of how fit you are, if your strategy or technique is poor, it won't matter. This is why the inclusion of women in the show makes sense. If it had been a pure contest of speed and power, there would have been no point in including the weaker sex. That being said, it's not like female competitors are equally as likely to win. While the show does its best to balance things out, nothing can make up for biology, a bitter reality that the first quest showcases perfectly. In it, two competitors fight over a ball. Whoever is holding it once the clock runs out wins. Obviously, this favors the strong and martially trained. However, there is a loophole. If your hang time was ranked high, you get to pick your opponent as well as the arena, with one being more focused on agility. This gives smaller competitors a chance. Since they outperformed their bulkier counterparts on the balls, they can conjure up a strategy to make up for the size imbalance. That, as you'll see, doesn't always work. Many times, David slips up and loses the ball, and once Goliath has a grip on it, it's pretty much over. This unescapable reality of absolute power is never more apparent than when a man faces a woman, with the most painful example being the fight between a female bodybuilder and a male MMA fighter. The guy toys with her the entire time, and despite her muscles, the girl stands absolutely no chance. 
Some might call the man sexist for willingly selecting a female opponent to humiliate her. And I would understand why. There was something disturbing in seeing a biological male crush and dominate a woman. Despite all her efforts and the hefty amount of male hormones she'd been injecting, all of that amounted to nothing in the face of the obvious biological advantage that nature procures men. But that was the point. To show that it is futile for women to try and compete against men on their turf, and that attempting it often results in disaster for the weaker sex. As such, selecting a female opponent guarantees victory. And while dishonorable, real sexism would be to try and protect women from this inferiority. Something that the other men willingly did, as they mostly opted to face each other instead. At the end of Quest 1, only 50 gladiators remain. So far, no one profile emerges as dominant, and the cast still showcases a mix of gymnasts, fitness models, and martial artists. What is striking at this point is the vibe. While you could expect the competitors to be on edge, what prevails instead is a feeling of camaraderie that one wouldn't expect from a survival game. Even during the savage one-on-one -on -one battles, Mutual respect and cheerful attitudes were the norm, challenging the idea of fitness enthusiasts being self-centered twats, devoid of grace or honor. Of course, it doesn't stop the participants from behaving like regular gym rats. Put 50 athletes in a room full of protein powder and lifting equipment, and they'll soon start banging out pull-ups and comparing their muscles. That's just how us meatheads bound. More importantly, it displays true inclusivity. Regardless of their sport or background, everyone is getting along, united under the banner of health and fitness. The loser of each match would bow respectfully, offering words of encouragement to the victor and receiving praise in return. Everyone looks out for each other, with the aim to propel the group to greater heights. Something that Westerners could learn from. Sadly, not everything is sunshine and rainbows in a nation, and PD use is as rampant here as it is in every competition around the globe. However, I would say that due to the nature of the challenges, those using drugs were not at much of an advantage, something perfectly demonstrated by the second quest. Instead of duels, the athletes are now split in 10 teams of 5, all competing against one another for the remaining 25 slots. The goal is simple, to build a bridge as fast as possible to be able to transport bags of sand to the other side. The team that amassed the most sand at the end wins, Sounds easy? Not when you take into account that the bridge is unstable and can only support one passenger at a time. What looks like a brainless back and forth turns into a game of logistics, while the team with the best organization can triumph over a superior roster. If your crew has too many heavies, you will lack speed. But if you rely too much on quickness, you won't carry as much sand per trip. Speed is of the essence, but if you rush, you lose. Times and times again, stacked teams would try to build the bridge as fast as possible, while less dominant troops would approach the matter more methodically, often resulting in victory. This is the turning point of the show, while the first quest prioritized individual strength, this task fell to its participants based on their collaboration skills. Physical 100 is called a survival show for a reason. The goal here is not to win the most medals, but to be the last one standing. 
As such, brain matters as much as brawn, and traits like smarts and fortitude are required to be deemed fittest of them all. The consolation game that follows serves as a good example of this. To save their torsos, which if smashed signed their elimination from the show, the newly defeated participants are tasked with keeping it in the air by holding onto a rope. Monkey brain logic dictates that the best way to survive this is just to yank on it as hard as possible. But a basic understanding of gravity would reveal the opposite. That standing upright and pulling is actually detrimental and that the best way to get a second shot at re-entering the show is to let your body weight do the holding for you. It is with that mix of guts and intellect that the 100 pounds Shim Yu Dom managed to defeat wrestlers twice her weight, despite the obvious disadvantage in strength. That determination would also greatly serve her in the third quest, that would have the 30 remaining participants assemble, then push a two tons wooden boat across a sandy beach. This is where the show peaks. Not only is this prime entertainment, but it also perfectly demonstrates that more than just a string of physical gauntlets, Physical 100 is first and foremost about mental strength. Dragging a giant boat up a ramp is not just a matter of ingenuity or power. You also have to surpass the discouragement and fatigue that comes with exerting yourself for long periods of time. Because if you stop moving, you lose. In this regard, I was pleasantly surprised to see that the women wanted it just as bad as the men. It shouldn't be a shock. These are all professional athletes at the top of their sports. But it was interesting to see that, regardless of biological sex, the fire burning inside of them shines just as bright. This is the true nature of this game. At some point, it stops being about who's the fittest and becomes a matter of who wants it the most. In a way, this perfectly mimics life. Oftentimes, those that make it aren't the most gifted or skilled, but the ones that are willing to hang on until they've exhausted every drop of strength in their body. Witnessing this display of human excellence should ignite in you the desire to better yourself. This is the power of Physical 100, and why I believe it to be especially culturally relevant today. In this age of bogus body positivity, it is refreshing to be presented with what humanity could be if we stopped being such pansies. I'm honestly shocked that Netflix even aired this. Not only does the show provide male viewers with ample examples of masculine role models and brotherhood, but it also doesn't attempt to balance it out by pandering to the woke crowd in the form of body type inclusions that obviously don't belong there. The end product is an incredibly well-balanced cast of physiques made up of individuals who all have the same passion and therefore share the same space. That's the type of inclusivity I can get behind. After the third quest comes the fourth, that will determine the five finalists and hopefully answer our question, what does the perfect body look like? Unsurprisingly, when looking at the remaining parties, the conclusion is unconvincing. The cast still boasts a diverse roster of athletes, ranging from MMA fighter to strongman. Does it then maybe mean that there is no such thing as peak performance? Not really. It's just that we haven't dug deep enough yet. And that's the point of the next round. To put the remaining candidates through a hyper-specialized contest that will help determine who within their rank is the best.
what follows is an orgy of male power fantasy. Between having to hold a 100 kg stone like Atlas, or pushing one up a slope for time like Sisyphus, I felt like I was watching a grapplebacky episode. This is also the part that should revigorate your decision to stay natty. I don't want to spoil, but the enhanced athletes get mercilessly outclassed by their natural counterparts. At last, the long-awaited twist that anyone with two brain cells had seen coming. Just because you look better than the next guy doesn't mean you're gonna win. The last remaining torsos are not the aesthetic ones, much to my chagrin. I wasn't surprised by the winner. I knew that there was very little chance that my favorite, a retired athlete and bodybuilder, would be able to prevail over Olympic medalists. In that, the show fulfilled its initial promise. The last one standing wasn't the biggest, but the most functional. Did this make me question my commitment to natural bodybuilding? No. I always knew that training for looks was subpar for performance. If anything, it confronted me in my choice. The conclusion of Physical 100 is not that everyone should be training for function, but that the true beauty of our community comes from its diversity. Had the lineup for the show been made up of a hundred clones, it would have been incredibly boring. All the fun was in watching different types of athletes battle it out with the body that they built and love. I'm certain that if you watch this show, you will also end up identifying with one of the candidates. You'll watch them suffer, struggle and adapt. And most likely, you'll also see them lose. But it won't matter. What will stick with you is the spirit of competition and respect that permeates every human interaction in the show. I especially recommend women watch it, as seeing other girls push their limits might encourage you to start working out. Not in a childish attempt to out badass men, but in an effort to become the best you can be. Oftentimes, it seems that typically masculine concepts like self-improvement are unreconciliable with modern media. This show proves otherwise. If you haven't yet, go watch it. And if you have, let me know in the comments who's your favorite athlete and why. To all my brothers and sisters, thank you for watching and have a good night.